So if you're an older beginner wondering if you've got the time or the ability to get good at guitar, then take some satisfaction from knowing that there are novices like myself learning and a lot of you subscribers with me, but also there's some famous guitar players who got their start later in life. So I'm talking about people who are older than their teens, way up to people who are in their 70s, and we're going to cover some of those today. Some of them you may have heard of, and if you haven't, then you've got some that you can add to your playlist. It's more difficult in the fact that you're busier and you've got more responsibilities in life, but it just means that you have to be more intentional with your learning. However, you will not somehow have a limitation on how well you can play based solely on your age. Many adults believe that learning guitar is similar to learning a new language, and trust me, it isn't. It's easier. Learning a language is really hard. Um, I travelled through South America some while ago and I stayed there and my wife speaks Spanish and I learned and I was absorbed in the culture and that's what they say is the best way to learn. And I never made as much progress as I did within a few months of playing guitar. It's actually very different because there's no central area of the brain dedicated to music. Adults even have an advantage over children when it comes to learning guitar because they can see and hear things that children can't. But there's no need to take my word for it. Let's look at some late bloomer guitarists. John Leslie Montgomery was born in 1923 in Indianapolis. One evening, while dancing with his wife as a newlywed, Wes heard Charlie Christian for the first time. And the very next day, he went out and got his own guitar and spent the next year or so trying to play like Christian. Having taught himself to play, he was soon playing in clubs as a 21-year-old newbie. By day he worked as a welder at a milk company, but by night he was out playing, imitating those Charlie Christian solos. A few years later in 1948, jazz musician Leo Hampton was on tour with a stop in Indy where he heard Wes play. He just so happened to be looking for a guitarist and here was this guy playing in a club who sounded a lot like Charlie Christian. He had a unique way of playing with the side of his thumb. It was a soft attack, but he maintained the kind of rhythmic drive and he had a very distinct use of octaves that came about from experimenting due to owning a guitar that constantly fell out of tune. Leo was impressed and Montgomery was hired. Wes spent the next two years in Hampton's band. He was offered opportunities to play with Charlie Mingus, Milt Buckner and Fats Navarro, but ultimately turned them down. He was already in his mid-30s by the time he was getting noticed in the jazz world. He continued playing the clubs in his hometown while keeping a full-time job and supporting a wife and six kids. I thought well, I had problems, I've got two kids and a full-time job. Doesn't have anything on this guy. In 1959, producer Orin Keepnews had a new label and was persuaded by saxophone great Cannon Adderley to go check out this local legend named Wes Montgomery out in the Midwest city of Indianapolis. Cannon was very enthusiastic about it, so Keepnews agreed. He checked him out at his usual gig, then by sunrise Montgomery was signed. Wes continued to work with Oren for about five years and became quite famous. He was putting out albums very regularly, but unfortunately he had his career and his life cut short by a fatal heart attack at the age of 45 in June 1968. He was often described as an unassuming man and one who had no idea how infinitely talented he was. Just like himself really and won many awards, including Jazz Man of the Year in 1967 and a couple of Grammy Awards. And Wes Montgomery is considered one of the greatest jazz guitarists of all time. His real name's John Cummings, but you may know him as Johnny Ramone of the Ramones. He was born in 1948 in Queens, New York, and he was a big Yankees fan and an avid baseball card collector. Now, he played a little bit of guitar when he was a teenager, but not at all serious. In 1974, he and Douglas Colvin, soon to be known as Dee Dee Ramone, went to a music shop where Johnny bought a guitar and Dee Dee bought a bass. They collaborated with Jeffrey Hyman, Joey Ramone, and Tamas Erdely, Tommy Ramone, and the Ramones band was born. Johnny's technique was mostly that of a rhythm electric guitarist, playing all downstrokes, full bar chords, and a very aggressive and rhythmic attack. This was all pretty unique at the time for a guitarist, and occasionally he did play some lead using bass pentatonic ideas. However, most solos on the Ramones' recordings were done by uncredited guests. Johnny was heavily inspired by Jimmy Page, which is where his style of fast rhythmic downstrokes most likely came from. He also used a lot of gain and distortion, which was another unique idea at the time. His techniques went on to inspire guitarists in the new wave of British heavy metal, alternative rock and thrash. Although his playing may seem simple and he makes it look easy, what he did on the guitar was a lot more complicated 
and difficult than it appears. There's a beauty in simplicity. Johnny died in 2004 following a battle with prostate cancer at the age of 55, but an annual memorial is held every year at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery in Los Angeles. If you haven't joined me before, my name's Luke, and my channel is all about my beginner guitar journey, tips that I share along the way, and guitar course reviews. If that's something you're interested in, please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It greatly helps me out. Chuck Berry is a household name in rock. In fact, he's known as the father of rock and roll. Born in 1926, he started playing as a young man since he had such a big interest in music. Having had his first public performance at the age of 15, his playing life was interrupted, which is why I'm including it here, because he had such a gap in between that it would have almost been like picking up the guitar again. The interruption came about because he got arrested for armed robbery. That has a way of doing that. He was then sent to the Intermediate Reformatory for Young Men at Algoa in 1944 when he was 18 for three years. Having been convicted of robbing three stores and stealing a car at gunpoint, Berry would later recount in his autobiography that his pistol was non-functional. While incarcerated, he formed a scene quartet, which was good enough to be allowed to perform outside the detention facility. After being released on his 21st birthday, he got married, started a family, and worked several jobs, including as a factory worker, janitor, and beautician. He resumed playing in the early 1950s and started playing in local clubs. With his affinity for music and natural giftings, it wasn't too hard to get back on the saddle. And in 1955, he met Muddy Waters, who suggested he hook up with Leonard Chess of Chess Records. Even though Berry was more interested in recording his own blues music, Chess liked his version of Ida Red and had him record it on May of 1955. He did so under the title Maybelline, which sold over a million copies and reached number one on the rhythm and blues charts, and number five on Billboard's bestseller in stores chart. At almost 30 years old, Chuck Berry now had a career in music. He went on to become one of the chief influencers and inventors of the rock and roll genre, his music wasn't the only thing that inspired an entire movement and subculture, but his showmanship. He's the man who created the rock stars. His overall musicianship and attitude birthed what we now know as rock music, which is absolutely astounding. And to think he went from being just a normal, responsible adult with a family and a job to becoming a musical and cultural icon in less than 10 years. He's cited as a major influence of Elvis Presley, Hendrix, The Beatles, The Stones, ELO, ACDC, The Yardbirds, The Grateful Dead, David Bowie, and Buddy Holly, just to name a few. John Lennon provided one of my favorite quotes about him, and that was, if you try to give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Berry. Perry died on March 18th, 2017, at the grand old age of 90. If you want some great inspiration, I recommend reading Barry's autobiography that came out in 1987. If you read that, you will never say it's too late for me to start learning guitar. In fact, you won't use age or season of life as an excuse for pretty much anything else either. Speaking of not being too old, James Lewis Carter Ford, AKA T-Model Ford, was not in his late 20s or 30s when he started playing. Nope, he was in his 70s. Although the date of his birth is not certain, his likely birthday is listed as June 24th, 1923. Ford's life is an interesting and tragic story, starting with an abusive father and continuing with a life of distress and violence. He was sentenced to 10 years on a chain gang for murder, had several wives and an unknown amount of children. Ford was illiterate and worked various blue collar jobs, including plowing fields and working at a sawmill as a foreman and truck driver, which is where he got the nickname T-Model. Following his release from the chain gang after only two of the original 10 year sentence, he stayed in trouble with the law. When his fifth wife left him, geez, one's enough, she left him a guitar and that's when Ford learned how to play. Different sources report different ages for when this happened, with some saying he was 58 and others saying 75. Either way, he was no spring chicken. And being a native of Mississippi, he of course taught himself guitar so that he could play Delta Blues. He was discovered in 1995 by Matthew Johnson of Fat Possum Records and released five albums from 1997 to 2008. In 2008, he began working with the band Gravel Road, with whom he toured and played with until 2010. In 2010, he suffered a stroke but still managed to complete the tour, and in 2013, he died of respiratory failure. These examples prove that you can learn guitar at any point in your life. They just happen to be famous cases. 
There's countless people out there who've learned to play guitar later in life. It's just you won't hear about them, you won't heard their names. So it's worth remembering that age is just a number and it's only a barrier if you choose it to be. To paraphrase an old quote, music is too important to be left to the professionals. Until the next one, cheers.